Welcome back to Empower Your Team. Today we are joined by Tori Henderson, who is Master Certified Life Coach, Teacher, and Owner of LifeCoachingForParents.com. She has helped hundreds of overworked and exhausted super moms transform their parenting so they can more fully enjoy their life as a mom. Tori is host of the Super Mom is Getting Tired podcast and is devoted to helping moms release the burdens and the guilt so they can make the most of this time of their lives. Tori, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Would you mind telling us how you came into the work that you do? Well, I'm sure like a lot of people through experience, right? I, I, my whole background was in working with children. I, you know, I loved kids. I was a family life educator, taught sex education for many years, taught fourth grade in the classroom. I was a reading specialist, all the things with children. But when I became a mom, it rocked my world. Let's just say, like, I thought I knew everything about child development, human development. I read a ton of books for fun. I just loved parenting as a topic. And then I became a mom and I was like, oh my God, this is so right. much harder than I ever thought it would be. Mm -hmm. And tr so I started kind of devouring parenting books. I started teaching parent education and in my local area. And I just, it was missing something because the more books I read about how to be a good mom, the well, two things I noticed. One is I'd be really good for a couple of days, you know, like, let's say it was around um, the media and the mind, right? How media affects children's brains. And so I'd be like, okay, no TV, no iPads, like, you know, we're going to be wholesome and pure and be outside all the time. And, and I'd be really good for like three or four days. And then I would just slowly start to slip back into my old ways. Mm -hmm. And then what happened is I would start feeling guilty and I would read these parenting books with these great ideas. And then I would feel just like bad about myself. Like I'm not doing it right. If I was a good mom, I would have I would do everything perfectly. I definitely had a lot of perfectionism and just put a lot of pressure on myself. And so then when I found life coaching, I was, I thought, okay, this is the perfect merriment, you know, here, this combining parent education with life coaching, because life coaching is all about identifying like what's not working for you, kind mm -hmm. of really figuring out who you are as a mom, based on who you think you should be and what society kind of tells us it makes us a good mom, but what makes me come to life and helps me thrive. And so that I can be the mom I want to be and feel really proud of my job is parenting, but also enjoy the journey. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that came down to what I call the four P's. And it was helping moms alleviate perfectionism, people pleasing, self-pressure, and pushing through. Like, I'm tired, but I can't afford to be tired. You know, well, I just need mm -hmm. to get more done and then I'll, I can relax and just mm -hmm. this pushing energy. So that's a lot of what I spend my time helping moms do is watching out for these, I call them the invisible kryptonite, these energy drains that you don't even know are making you so tired and robbing you of your ability to enjoy your life. And I definitely had all four of them. <laughs> Perfectionism, people pleasing, pushing through and self-pressure. So once you can only remove those, you can breathe <laughs> and you start to like be able to like prioritize and enjoy your life and have more fun with your kids and that kind of thing. So, oh my gosh, that's so amazing. Cause there's so much out there that's just, oh no, you're supposed to do it this way. It should be do done this way. Oh, I can't believe that, you know, so, judgment, judgment. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm so glad that <laughs> you're there to say, okay, let's, let's reevaluate this for a minute. So thank you. All right, so this week we're talking to parents of teens, uh, kids that are getting ready to go off to college, or maybe they already have, or something similar to college. Um, and so what I wanted to talk with you about today is, you know, sometimes our kids aren't thriving quite like we hoped or wanted to. Maybe they're having a really hard transition into the grade that they're in, or the new school that they're at, or something like that. Um, how, I guess my big question for you today is how can we as parents support our kids when they're having kind of a rough time? Yes. So this happens to me 
as a coach, I get a lot of clients whose kids have gone off to college and they call mom and they, what I like to say, they dump their crap in her lap. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, my roommates are mean and I can't get my classes and my teachers are, you know, so unfair and just venting, right? We've got mm -hmm. venting is there's nothing wrong with venting. Venting makes us feel better. But when a college kid vents to a mom, moms often carry this around as a very heavy burden. And it's hard to know how to support our kid who's away from home and trying to figure things out when they're coming to us and complaining, right? We want to hear the good stuff. We want to know that they're having fun and thriving. And, and it's super hard when they decide that we are the person to uh, dump their problems on. And then they hang up the phone and they feel better and they can go about their day and they're like refueled. And we're sitting there with a ton of bricks on our shoulders for a week feeling like crap, feeling like we made a big mistake and maybe we should, our kids should come home and cook. And they don't even think about it again. So, <laughs> so when I'm talking with moms who, I, I like to kind of generalize it and say, let's say your kid has fallen down a well. Maybe they went off to college with high expectations of a great social life and they're sitting at home in their room on their cell phone playing video games. And May, or maybe it's school is harder than they thought and they're really stressed out or, you know, whatever reason, bad things are happening, their roommate doesn't get along, whatever. You just, if your kid has anxiety, depression, whatever, let's say your kid has fallen down a well. Well, moms tend to help in one of two ways that don't really help them that much. One is that we fall down the well with them. And we're like, oh my God, this is so hard. Col you could hear moms do this when they talk about we, like college is so hard. We're having a really rough time, you know, <laughs> and they start to pluralize. It's like they've fallen down the well along with their kid and it's dark down here and it's cold and I don't know how to get out of here. So that sometimes can make the kid feel a little better because at least they are not alone down at the bottom of the well and they feel like mm -hmm. their mom gets it and they feel sort of like validated in their suffering, okay. but it doesn't help them climb out of the well and mm -hmm. it doesn't help, certainly doesn't help mom feel any better mm -hmm. because mom's sitting at the bottom of the well along with them. And so it's a situation that just kind of perpetuates sitting at the bottom of the well together. And then you and your kid, your kid kind of learns like, oh, mom, it's so weird how they think like, like mom wants to hear me complain. Like, because she's, because this is what happens. A mom, they'll start doing this uh, where they interview for pain. How's it going with the roommate? Oh, Was your yeah. teacher nice to you today? Because they want to have this like an intimate relationship with their kids. And they want their kids to feel like they can talk to them. They'll actually start interviewing for pain and suffering and be like, where are you suffering so that you can tell me about it so that we can feel close and connected, mm -hmm. but we both are sitting at the bottom of the well. Okay. We try to help, but it doesn't really help. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So the other way in which moms try to help, that doesn't really help, is we just tell them what to do to climb out of the well. It's so obvious to us, right? Like as a mom, <laughs> We can look at them and be like, dude, you just got to email the teacher. Go to the office hours, talk to your professor, introduce yourself, help, you know, tell him you want to get into his class. And like, we've got all these great ideas, you know, well, why don't you just host a party in your room, invite your roommates, keep your door open so that people know you're wanting to socialize, plan a game night. We've got ideas coming out of our ears. Yeah. And yeah. so we just stand there above the well and be like, dude, you don't have to stay at the bottom of the well. You can shimmy up the sides. You can climb up the ladder. Look, I'll throw you a rope. I'll throw you 10 ropes. Here's a ladder. The reason this doesn't work, it, it kind of makes us feel good. It makes us feel better like temporarily because we're like, oh, I have the solution to my child's problem. That kind of gives mm -hmm. us a little high, right? A little dopamine hit. But it feels worse over the long run because our kids don't take our advice and it makes the child feel disempowered, like they can't solve their own problems. Okay. Because they don't want to be calling mom for advice when they're 19 years old. They want to figure these things out on their own or ask friends and lean on peers 
or a YouTuber or anything else. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, so these are the two ways moms try to help or parents try to help dads do this too. That just don't really help very much. Mm -hmm. And so the way in which I like to help empower my clients to empower their teens is this idea of sitting on the ground above the well. So you're nearby, you're acknowledging that they're down the well. You're not pretending, you're not ignoring it. You're not being like, oh, you'll be fine. <laughs> anxiety, shm anxiety, whatever. Like, you know, <laughs> who cares? You just need to go out there. To, like, you're, no, you're acknowledging like, wow, I can see that, you know, going to the cafeteria is really triggering your anxiety and it's hard to deal with the noise and the people and the not knowing where to go and the dining hall, I guess they don't call it cafeterias in college, do they? <laughs> dining commons, whatever. So that there's certain things that are going to trigger, you know, your, your anxiety or your child to not feel well. So you're acknowledging that they're down a well. You're like, yeah, I can see it does not look pleasant down there. I can see why you don't like it. It looks dark. It looks cold. Validating where they're at, mm -hmm. but not falling down, but mm -hmm. staying above ground and saying like up here, the sun is shining, the sky is blue. Like a lot of times women tend to commiserate right? If you and I were to get together for a glass of wine and you're like, oh, I had this really bad day. You know, my husband's being a jerk and, you know, my boss just demoted me. Like that would not be the moment for me to tell you how loving my husband is and that I just got a promotion. Like right. we just, we know the nuances of socializing that that's ill-timed, right? So I would find the areas of my life to complain about so that you and I could match. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so sometimes it doesn't feel right as a mom with our kids to be like, well, everything is great here at home, but it does help our children. Hmm. They like to know that, you know, what the dog is up to <laughs> and what the neighbors are up to and that, you know, well, your dad just planted a new tree in the backyard or whatever, like <laughs> the silly mundane stuff of ordinary life. Mm -hmm. And that dad's happy and mom's happy because that helps them feel more balanced. You know, if, if they are responsible for uh, us having a bad day and mm -hmm. us feeling like we're falling down a well, that puts a lot of pressure on them. Then they feel like I have to be happy in order to make my parents happy and their well-being is in my hands. Mm -hmm. It's just like if you came home from work and you had a stressful day at work and you walk into the house and your kids see that you're in a bad mood, you don't want them to suddenly like tell you all the shitty stuff about their day. <laughs> you want right. them to be like, oh, guess what? I won this award at school and, you know, I've got a party to go to this weekend and, you know, we won our basketball game. Like you want to hear the good stuff because they're your family and we're all, they can lift you up, right? Mm. And so I think it's, it's helpful for our college kids, our teenagers, our young adults to hear that we're doing well and to, that it's not helpful to, for us to commiserate with them. And Fascinating. It seems so counterintuitive. <laughs> it's, you know, we got this training, this socialized training to like with our peers, right? And then to shift it with family because... It took me a long time to realize that because I would do it with my husband. My husband, he's kind of a workaholic and a stressaholic, and he would come home and he would tell me all the dramatic, stressful things that happened to work. And I felt like I had to match it. Yeah. Be like, yeah, and, you know, your kid threw up and your daughter peed her pants, whatever. And I would like pull out the like worst parts of my day. And it took me forever for him to say, like, I want to hear about the good time. I want to hear about you relaxing in the backyard while the kids swim in the pool and you just sat there and ate a popsicle. Like, I want to hear about that. Like, really? You don't want to hear how I've toiled and sweated and worked really hard? He's like, no. He's like, I want to remember what it is I'm working for oh, wow. so that I can have a happy wife and happy kids. I was like, oh my God. Like, it just took a long time to get that into the brain. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Okay. So, and you're right, that's such a huge shift too, because you're right, I like to be, when I've had a bad time, then I like to be like, yes, vent, but then I want to be pulled out of that and brought into something else. I want to think about other things and better things. Or that that could be your story, 
mm-hmm. but it doesn't have to be my story, right? Like you could have a bad day and I can talk about my, you know, I got a new dishwasher, whatever the excitement that happens when you're 50 years old and your kids right. are in the house, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but it's this idea of acknowledging where they're at and offering help. Like, well, if you ever need help, know Mm -hmm. that I can throw you a rope. I can teach you how to shimmy. (laughs) You know, there's YouTubers out there that can show you how to shimmy up a well. Like you don't, you don't have to be the one to rescue them. Okay. You can say like, well, you know, what are your, what does your roommate think about the situation? And encouraging them to talk to other people or talk to your professor, see if he has any suggestions, you know, reminding them that there's a, uh, the counseling center at school. I mean, the school, the like mental health centers are bombarded these days yeah. with COVID and all the mental health issues. But the great thing about that is they are doing a lot more groups than ever before, mm-hmm. which is so helpful when you're 19 and people are hesitant because, you know, whatever reasons, but the groups are great because here's what comes out of being in a group situation. <laughs> Either you're like, hey, my problems aren't that bad. Yeah. <laughs> I feel pretty good about myself. <laughs> or you're like, oh my gosh, like I feel seen and heard and everybody gets it. I'm around other people who are going through the same thing. I'm not alone. And so it, it just helps you put it in perspective or you're like, oh, I never even thought about worrying about that. Like, God, thank God I don't have that problem. Mm -hmm. And it just gives you this perspective that's hard to find on social media, which is where these kids are looking for help, right? Mm -hmm. And answers. So, so learning how to kind of stay above the well, not get pulled down, enjoy your life and have a kid who's struggling and that that's okay. That's part of the journey. It's not supposed to be I think we've, we, I think we think we're, our kids are supposed to be happy all the time mm-hmm. and we yeah. forget about the value of a struggle. Mm. That's true. That's true. Okay. So instead of taking it all on, we, we let them vent, but we don't take it on to ourselves yes. and we don't immediately try to solve their problem for them by throwing a bunch of ideas at them. We let them know that they can ask us for what they want or need. You can absolutely ask them. So would you like some advice? Mm, Okay. Would you like a suggestion? And I don't know about anybody else's, but I've got an incoming college freshman. Mm -hmm. So a senior just graduated high school and a college senior. Uh, Neither one of them would say yes to that question of, do you want my advice? I can guarantee it. And that's just great. Like, I think it's just that good reminder for moms. Like if you ask them, like, do you want a suggestion or do you want some advice or do you want some help? Mm -hmm. Chances are they're going to say no. And it's like, okay, why, why is that such a universal thing that 19 to 22 year olds don't want our help? There must be something beneficial for them in the struggle. Right. I was going to say that's a good thing though, right? That's a good thing that they want to try to figure it out for themselves. It's only going to make them more capable later on. Yeah, totally. And so we rob them of that ability to kind of learn how to solve their own problems when we jump in and we think we know and we, you know, have the answers and stuff. So we want, it's just this hard thing because of course, as parents, you want them to be happy. And gen- generally, like, like it really feels like I want my children to be like happy 24 hours a day, seven days a week for like now until the rest of their lives. Like, right. <laughs> like that feels really true. <laughs> yeah. Like, because then I get to be happy and you know? I, who doesn't want to be happy. Right. Yeah. But when we go to the other part of our brain, like realistically, logically, that would be a very narrow existence. That's true. You want them to have the whole range of human experiences. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want them to be happy if their dog dies and they, you don't want them to be, you want them to be disappointed if they, you know, tried out for the volleyball team and didn't make it. Like those are normal human emotions. Yeah, that's true. 
And so it's like this mom brain (laughs) versus like the logical brain that says, no, actually good things can come from struggling. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for sharing that because yeah, I I didn't think about how um, it's different socially with our friends than it would be for our family members. Um, And it's just good to have that reminder of it's a good thing if they want to try to figure it out for themselves. And if you can just let them know that you're that you're there if they need you, which is great. It's great. And it's also extremely hard for moms who love their babies so much. And they just I was talking to this mom the other day and um, she said that this she's got a teenager who's not making really good choices. And she's watching her not make good choices on a regular basis. And she's living with her, right? And so I said, it's kind of like watching your teenager just like gushing blood. Mm. (laughs) And they're like walking around the house and they're like getting blood on all the furniture and all the walls that are gushing blood. And then for a mom, you're like, I must stop the bleeding. I must stop the bleeding. I got to stop it. And the kid's like, no, no, I'm good. No, I want to bleed. And you're like, but you're getting it all over the furniture uh-huh. and the carpet. And you're like, eh, it's not a big deal. You know, it'll, it'll come out. And it's like, how am I supposed to watch my child lead yeah. and feel okay about that? And f- just like, let it happen. It's, it feels counterintuitive. It feels very visceral. We want to stop the bleeding. Yeah. So one of the mantras that I like to use when we're in this situation of watching a kid really struggle, but they're refusing help Mm -hmm. is they're learning things from this experience that I could never teach them. Mm. Oh, wow. Just that reminder, you know, that like, there's a reason why they want to stay in the struggle. There's something they're learning and gaining from this that is, has nothing to do with me. And that I get to, I get, but I could still be happy. I don't have to join them in the struggle. And it's also nice to take breaks from watching your child bleed once in a while. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, to not have to watch it on a daily basis is also helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. What, what a big shift and a big transition for parents and their kids and families to go through. So we're so glad that there are people like you out there, Tori, that can help us through it. So you brought uh, a free gift for our families today. I did. So I have, so I'm offering a, a, well, a couple things actually. So I'm offering uh, uh, 12 texts to send your college student to show your support and uplift them, right? So like if they're stressed out, there's 12 little texts, just like little ideas of things, because so often as moms, we want to be like, are you okay? kind of interviewing for pain, you know, are you alive? Are you okay? Are you doing all right? And we, we want it because we feel stressed and we want them to alleviate our stress. We're like, okay, mm-hmm. I could go to sleep much easier if I just know that you're like safe and well, you know, are you having fun? Are you having a good time? Please tell me you are. Right. And so this is like a 12 text written down so you can look at it and text these things, which are much more like supportive. One thing that, um, that works really well when you're communicating with teens and young adults is confidence, your own confidence in their ability to Mm -hmm. solve their own problems, to rise to the occasion, to figure things out. And so just like some practice, that's the nice thing is when they're away from home, you can kind of think about things before you say them and over text, same thing, right? You can think about it before you write it. It's like, what is it I really want them to take away from this? I want them to feel like I trust them and that I'm confident in them, even if they're not confident in themselves, that I can kind of boost that confidence. So these are just texts to send your kid to kind of lift them up and remind them of how capable they are. Oh, that's perfect. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah. But I have another thing that I wanted to talk about. So I, so I am a soon to be empty nester and I'm feeling like we deserve a rite of passage as parents, because when you're becoming a mom, there's so much like baby showers and there's like lots of celebrations and gatherings for you to help support you in this transition. 
-hmm. But when you're coming out the other end, I don't know, there's nobody around. I mean, like, especially because after COVID, I've lost so much of my community, you know, that, and with high school, it's just kind of, you're not really hanging out with the other parents like you did when they were little. And so your community really dwindles uh, throughout the years of schooling. And so there isn't this like rite of passage for parents when kids go off to college or they graduate high school for moms, especially. And so as a present to myself, <laughs> uh, when for, to celebrate my empty nest, I bought the domain Empty Nest Mom Fest. And I am planning parties, weekend retreats, once single day retreats to celebrate and offer a rite of passage to moms who are in the emptying nest. It could be just transitioning into that or have officially emptied. And they just want to take this time to focus on themselves and be like, okay, finally, I get to put myself first, but like, I haven't done that for 20 years. What does that look like? And really to kind of get clear on your next chapter of what do I want? And what is it? you know, how can I, because the stuff I'm talking about, like not falling down the well with your kid is not, it's easier said than done. Right. To be like, oh, it's a beautiful day here. Everything's great. Like, but what if it's not, what if you're super sad and lonely and you miss having kids and you miss mothering and you miss your life? Like mm -hmm. then the emptiness mom fest <laughs> is the place to go. So anyways, you can Google that. I'm planning actually uh, just, uh, Last night, I, mm -hmm. I decided I'm going to do one in Hawaii in September. So, oh and he wants to go to Hawaii with me for an emptiness mom fest in September. You can check it out. I'm super excited. Excellent. I will make sure to put that link below next next to the texts. So yeah, everyone yeah. We that. deserve a rite of passage. We deserve a celebration. We worked our butts off. That's true. And we deserve to acknowledge it while also kind of talking about our next chapter. Yep. So, yeah. And then I also am offering a free coaching call if anybody is struggling or they are just need help with the transition or the letting go. I work with a lot of parents with teens on kind of, you know, this like, letting go is probably one of the hardest things because it's motherhood so defines our identity. Mm -hmm. Like it's who we, I don't know about you, but I'm driving a minivan. Like I said, I had drove two minivans back to back. Like it is still a part of my identity. And, you know, I'm a mother. I have emptiness mom fest. I started this, you know, like mom's adventure club. Like me as a mom has been such a part of who I am. Yeah. And when you think about letting go of that motherhood stage of life, it it's really uh, daunting. And so so I do offer like, you know, coaching to help moms uh, let go of that and kind of redefine and create a new identity for ourselves. Um, but also when it comes to kids to do what I call the love more, care less strategy. Oh. <laughs> so this is like when kids are little, love and care go hand in hand. Right. You know, I'm wiping your butt because I love you. Otherwise, right. I would not be wiping your butt. <laughs> so, you know, I'm making you feels like five meals a day because I love you and I don't want you to go hungry or whatever. And so it's one and the same. But when our kids grow into adolescence and young adults, the care, us caring for them and about them starts to feel kind of infantilizing or like, um, I say like, like love unchecked turns into need dependency and control. Right. And so we don't want our kids to feel like we're controlling them. We don't want to need them to act a certain way and for us to feel good. And so we, I work with my clients on increasing the love while caring less mm -hmm. <laughs> about whether they show up for class what kind of, you know, or if they oversleep, whether they, you know, what they do with their friends, you know, on a Friday night, like staying home Friday night, whether they're engaging, whether they're playing Dungeons and Dragons or whatever, yeah. soccer, video game, like how are they going to take like, care less about the details? Mm -hmm. What what are they eating every day? And <laughs> how are they maintaining their nutrition and exercise habits? We got to learn to increase the love while decreasing the care yeah. so that your kids can start feeling like they are capable of caring for themselves while also feeling like mom has their back and this mm -hmm. has this unconditional love that no matter what you do, I'm still going to love you. I love that. I love that. It's a whole new balance. So 
Um, I'm so glad you're you're there for all of us. So I will make sure to put all of those links below this video so folks can reach out to you. Tori, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. My favorite subject to talk about. <laughs> all right. See you next time. Yeah, thanks, Emma.